Hey everyone, welcome to Hot Seat Number 7 on Crushing Classical, Redefining a Thriving Classical Music Career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and today we have Galen McCormick on the hot seat. Galen is a bass player with the Rochester Philharmonic and a prolific teacher. She is embarking on a new journey in her career due to hearing loss. She knows that eventually she will completely lose her hearing in both ears and wants to create what's next. On this hot seat, Eileen takes her through what that can look like. We discuss all that goes into creating and taking ownership of a totally new space. Before we start, a couple of quick things. Please join the conversation at facebook.com slash crushing classical as well as crushing classical on Instagram. If you love what you see, it would mean so much to us if you could comment on posts and share them with your classical musician friends and colleagues. Also, if you love these podcasts, please take a moment to review Crushing Classical on iTunes. Having more reviews helps more musicians to find our podcast, and we really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank Fix Music for being a sponsor of Crushing Classical Podcast. Have you checked out Fix yet for your sheet music purchases? I'm so excited to have them as a sponsor. It's a really great site. Fixmusic.com is your online resource for affordable, high-quality sheet music. Fix also offers unique buying options for individuals, teachers, and schools. Whether you have a large private teaching studio or you run a music program, Fix has a solution for you. Contact them through their website for more information. Fix offers priority and priority express shipping at super affordable rates, meaning they do not pad their shipping rates to make money. If you need sheet music fast, Fix will expedite it to you as inexpensively as possible. Also, just for crushing classical listeners, check the the show notes for a link to get 10% off your order. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Hey, Eileen. Hey, Galen. How are you? Hey, all right. Nice. Great. So we're on a hot seat today and Eileen is here and Galen McCormick is here to do a hot seat. And Eileen, I'll let you take it away because you usually ask the questions to the guest in the hot seat and kind of frame it for what we're going to talk about today. So let you go. Yeah. Okay, great. Awesome. So, um, you know, Galen, welcome to the call. So first of all, why don't you just tell us, you know, since we, I'm actually getting on this call knowing nothing about you um, you know, what you're bringing to the call. So I'm wondering if you can just kind of give us a backstory of, you know, who you are, where you're coming from, and what you're um, aiming to do so we can start with the, the sort of the foundation that we start with. Okay, sure. I am a bass player um, and a teacher. Like a lot of people, I have kind of a traditional story and traditional background, which is kind of going out the window for a lot of people. Um, I went to the Eastman School of Music for my undergrad degree, and I did uh, some freelance work in the early part of my career around um, first the eastern part of New York State and western Massachusetts. And then when I was 25, I got a part-time contract with the Rochester Philharmonic, and I started um, getting some higher-level freelance work around the Rochester area and doing some regional work around here. So I've been actually been living in Rochester since 1995. Um, and I got a full-time job with the Philharmonic after that. So I've been living and uh, teaching here in Rochester since then. Um, and I've been full-time with the orchestra, permanently full-time, only since 2011. But I've been on and off full-time at different periods since then. Um, and I've been teaching at the Eastman Community School, um, which is pre-college. It's sort of anything but college. It's uh, I have kids under 18, and I have... Uh, bigger kids who are usually over 65, (laughs) like retirees. And I also teach at the Nazareth uh, College. So I have a little collegiate studio and I have a private studio outside of that. Um, So in some ways, like I'm really a kind of a typical orchestra person who also has a private studio. Um, I'm at a kind of funky crossroads in my career right now because I lost my hearing about 10 months ago. Um, I have a disease in both of my ears that manifested 10 years ago in one side. I went deaf in one side about five or six years ago. And then about two years ago, the disease presented on the other side. And there was no guarantee that I would lose my hearing. But um, about Christmas time last year, I had a massive attack on that side. And I lost almost all the hearing in that ear. And I have not been playing with the orchestra since then. And it appears that I probably will not regain the full range of hearing in that side. So it's very difficult for me to hear my instrument now. 
Um, and it's, it's challenging. I'm still teaching a little bit. It's very, very challenging though, because I've lost all my low frequency hearing. So I am at a crossroads of trying to figure out what the next aspect of my career will be, because it's pretty evident to me that performance is not going to be a viable option going forward. So um, that's, that's where I am right now, um, is just feeling out a whole bunch of different things. And I have a lot of ideas, but I have no concrete plan that I want to present to you, Eileen. But you had some really interesting things you brought out when I took the starting line challenge a couple weeks ago, and you really sparked some great creativity in me. So I'm excited to talk to you today. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so tell me, like, what, what are some things that came out of that for you from doing that challenge? What are some things that you saw as far as, like, you know, you say it sparks some creativity. I'm interested in, um, you know, what did you walk away with? What do you see possible now that was not possible before? Well, one of the things I've noticed um, is that as I've continued to teach, I, I, I not only knew that I love teaching, I've become more and more convinced that, that I am a good teacher, which is a funny thing. I find, uh, I don't know if this is a female thing in particular, but like, for years, I've questioned whether I was a good teacher. I'm really hard on myself. I mean, my students have gotten into amazing places. I've sent students to Curtis and Eastman and like, you know, blah, blah, like name all the big conservatories. I've sent students there on full ride. And yet still, I'm constantly down on myself. But somehow now that I'm faced with this new challenge, I'm like, no, I'm a really good teacher. And I'm deriving like tons of joy out of it. Um, partly just in supporting kids, not just in music, but in like watching them grow and watching their development. Uh, and their personalities. And so I was just thinking a lot about that, that I wonder if teaching in a broader sense is something else I'm interested in going into. I've written three books of uh, Boeing technique. And during this period, while I was still, I was really, really sick earlier this year, I really could barely work or even get out of the house. I pitched an idea to a friend of mine about some duets, some better some pedagogical stuff that just doesn't exist out there. And I started working on those and honestly, they're hilarious and fun and things like that, things I had never thought about before. And so I've been working on those and they like, they kind of crack me up to work on them. And it's like a skill I didn't even know I had to compose music. So I think pedagogy is actually a bigger talent that I have that I didn't even realize. It's sort of been like a side gig for me to teach. Um, even though my studio is huge, <laughs> it still always okay. seemed like a side hobby. So it's that, but it's also, um, I've presented concerts and I've worked in um, not just concert presenting, but like in developing programs when I was in professional quintet. And it's something, there's something around that that I'm really interested in, but in reaching, I hate to say this because it's so blah and so vague, but like in reaching underserved communities. So in particular, now that I have this disability, I'm more and more interested in figuring out how to reach um this sounds really oxymoronic, but in how to reach deaf and hard of hearing communities. I am banging my head into a wall right now trying to figure out how I can attend this early music performance that's coming up in two weeks. Like I can still hear some things in this very small range. And there's a forte pianist who's coming to town. And I'm pretty sure that's an instrument I'll be able to hear because of the high, um, the uh, high frequency of the hammers hitting the strings. Like I can hear a harpsichord mm -hmm. pretty well, but I can't hear piano but I'm thinking forte piano, I will. I am spending so much time trying to find out from this church whether they're gonna run that instrument through the T-loop system. And like, no one can understand what I'm talking about. And I'm starting to think like, is this actually one of my new goals is to help make concerts more accessible for other people? Whether that means, you know, just this simple thing of interfacing with the technology or whether it's designing concert experiences that are groomed towards people with limited hearing. So these are some of the things that started to come up for me is like, just because I'm losing my hearing doesn't mean I have to stop enjoying music. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Question. Um, is your next gig, I'm assuming that it's going to have to require income. Yes or no? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I'm just asking because some people want to do what they're ne what's next for them. Not so much as a, income earning thing but as a you know like a thing they love to do well i would love for it to be both of those things <laughs> okay yeah i mean ideally yeah but i mean i'm just saying uh everybody comes on the hot seat for a different reason you know everybody's got a different purpose right um i mean the nice thing is i have a little buffer of time right now since i just started on disability i have this little buffer of time to play with different ideas um 
So I've pitched myself as like an intern to different people so I could learn different ideas. You know, I could be an assistant to different people while I get some different skills together um, while I still have disability income to kind of buffer me. So I do have some time oh. where I could play with a no income environment or, you know what I okay. mean, a non-paying gig. Yeah, exactly. And experiment with it a little bit. Mm hmm. OK. And are you um, just out of curiosity, are you going to be giving up your studio at some point? That's what I'm wondering right now is, is that your plan? Are you going to kind of phase out? What do you think? It, I'm just curious where you I'm only asking because I don't I'm totally cool with talking about the what you want to do next. But I'm just wondering what the you know, how, what you're going to do about what you've got now. I, yeah, I don't know. Initially, I thought I would have to. And, and I'm, I'm sort of now I'm sort of looking at it like, well, I think I'm just going to do this until I can't do it. Or, or like, until it doesn't make any sense anymore, because the students seem to be improving. I actually just added a day of student teaching because I've got so many kids coming on board that, you know, have never been with me before. Um, that, and I'm just pitching it to them like, you need to come meet me and see how I work now, because I can't tell you about your pitch. I can't tell you about how loud you're playing. And, and so far they're like, no, it's going really well. You know, I, I just can only teach up to a certain level and then I have to get rid of them <laughs> to someone who can talk about pitch. But I don't know. I mean, I, I'm totally in a quandary about that because it's still so new. Like this whole problem right. is so new that I, I don't know. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so now tell me, you know, uh, now that you are, you know, we're going to say going deaf, and I'm assuming you'll eventually be completely deaf. Do you assume that, or will you still have some hearing? I had assumed it. It's possible I'll have some, but I'm learning sign language now as like a, I might as well, because I think the, it seems very likely to me, but I just don't know how long it's going to take to get there. Sure, sure, that makes sense. So, and that's why I was wondering if you have, have first of all, have you explored um, the hard of hearing, the deaf community at all? Have you, I'm just curious how much you've gotten into it or, um, what their culture is, to. like what you've learned about that. Okay. Well, yeah. So I've just started to, um, the good news is in this particular community, we have a large deaf culture because we have the National Technical Institute for the Deaf here at Rochester Institute of Technology. So like, I'm super mm. excited about the fact that there is a whole community for me to go into. Um, and I joined a group recently, about two months ago, I went to a conference for the Association for Late Deaf and Adults. So like, there is, there are a couple different groups here. There's a national group that has a chapter here for um, the Hearing Loss Association uh, of America. I can never remember what the last A is, but like, there are groups that I can get involved in, um, which is helpful. I just feel like I'm in kind of this really special niche that I think you two will understand, which is that like, we don't talk about this as musicians. You don't talk uh, about getting no. injured and you don't talk about having hearing issues. And it kind of bugs me, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So it kind of bugs me. And I, I, that's one of the reasons I don't mind coming on and talking about this is that I feel like it's not right that we should have to hide these problems, you know? Like I didn't do anything mm -hmm. wrong to get this. <laughs> it just, it's a genetic right. problem that just, it manifested. It's unfortunate that there's no cure for what I have. And there's no treatment for what I have and it sucks and I hate having to give up playing, but here it is. So right. I, you know, if nothing else, I kind of want to come on and talk about it just to let other people know that like, yeah, it happens. And like, I'm not dead. I want to keep going. I want to find meaningful work and I want to still contribute somehow to our art form. Um, but yeah, there's so yes, to get back to your question. Yeah, there, there is, I haven't tapped too much into the deaf community here. I've just started to meet people and it is one of the reasons I wanted to start signing that even if I didn't go fully deaf, I wanted to be able to tap into that community and be a fully functional member of the community. Okay. Question for you. Have you, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, have you researched if there's anybody um, uh, already doing what you want to do, which is, or that what you're exploring doing, which is, um, connecting the deaf community with music, musical opportunities. Um, is there anyone, do you know of anyone who is currently doing this? No, that's actually next on my list of things I want to check out. Okay. Well, I part of the reason why be someone. there probably is, there probably is. But the reason why I bring this up is because you're in this really interesting spot right now where, so the first thing that came to me when you were talking about, you know, I'm a good teacher. I'm wondering if teaching in a broader sense is an option. Um, and then, you know, you got into composing a little bit, but pedagogy is your thing. But 
There's also an interest in, you know, the the deaf and hard of hearing communities and reaching, you know, like they're underserved in music. The first thing I thought of was it would be really amazing for you to um, at some point do a TED talk about this. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of TED talks? Oh, yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure. I, I don't like to assume. That's why I'm asking. I'm not, it's not that I think you're stupid. It's that some people don't know what it is. And so, <laughs> um, so, uh, that would be a really interesting thing for you to consider is what might a tag talk look like for you? In other words, what might your platform be if you were going to do a TED talk? Because this is something that's not talked about the, and by the way, a lot of people lose their hearing. This is not uh, it, it, I mean, it's it's not unique to the classical music community. It's actually, it's everywhere, but it's just the classical com music community doesn't like to talk about it. Right. Right. And probably yep. the whole world doesn't like to talk about it. Kind of like if you're losing your vision, you know, kind of like, you know, if you're losing an ability, like a really important ability, like hearing or sight. Yeah. Yeah. Or movement. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, like when somebody gets MS. There's an immediate, oh, my God, like they're going to lose their ability, their motor skills. Right. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, there's no known cure for MS. There's certainly mitigating. There's things you can mitigate it. You do to mitigate it. But there's no known cure for MS that I know of. And so um, but so these sort of this it's sort of a it's an interesting platform. I really like it because there's a um, it's a. You were once whole and complete, and now you're becoming not whole and complete. And how do you still be whole and complete when you don't feel whole and complete? Right. And so, and as a Buddhist, we, we say that we're actually whole all the time. And so that's what I've been wrapping my head around is like, just because I don't have my hearing does not mean that I'm not perfect still. And just when I look at somebody who, like, I've been playing at the cancer center now as a way to try to help myself wrap my head around this, that like, I'm still a musician, mm -hmm. even if I can't hear yeah. what I'm playing anymore. And so it's really interesting, you know, to watch people come through, don't have hair anymore because of chemo. And I'm like, they're still perfect, you know? And it's, yeah. A, yeah. So it's a really interesting concept because who says that I'm not perfect just because I can't hear it's a construct. So, I mean, it it's, it's really interesting, right? <laughs> it is a really, it's a really interesting sort of dilemma. I'm glad that you're, I'm sure that you've had moments of, you know, crying your eyes out about it. And then you have other moments where you're like, well, this is kind of interesting. You know what I mean? Um, oh, and, totally. Sure, <laughs> right. It's probably gone both ways for you. Um, yeah, I can and, only imagine. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to interject here. Um, I know of a lot of musicians who have varying degrees of hearing loss, too. Maybe they're not going, they don't have, you know, a situation like yours where they're going to be 100% deaf, but they have hearing loss or they have certain kind of um i know one musician who has some kind of a thing where he gets really bad ringing in his ears he can't and he actually ended up having to retire um i mean he was he was at an um like a normal retiring age anyway but um was having this for the last few years of his career and i'm sure you know only I know about it because those are the people that I worked with or whatever. And um, it's probably very common and we don't hear about people aren't talking about it. So it's really, mm -hmm. in, it's interesting. And the, I mean, think about it. Like, I think this every now and then an article will come out or something and they'll put like the, the symphony orchestra on a, on a list of, of what, um, of what the decibel level is that you get exposed to, you know, in an orchestra. Yeah. And it's, it's really high. It's like it's right really below high. chainsaw or something, you know, like it's loud. I, I, when I first started working here, I had to start wearing earplugs a majority of the time when I was in certain situations, like when the stage is too small or where we don't have risers. I mean, it just wasn't an option. I was in pain. Like the symbols were right behind me, you know? And so this is a thing, like there could be, there could be a lot, a lot to talk about in this conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I'm wondering what pedagogy would look like for you. Um, you know, a couple things that come to mind. And by the way, you don't have to take anything I give you. I'm just, I want to throw out some ideas. Does that work for you? Absolutely. Okay. So one thing is, um, 
you're you're in a really and by the way i could be misinterpreting this you just might be having a good day but uh you seem to be in a really good place about your hearing loss and that you know you've lost uh hearing in one ear and you're on your way in the second ear but you seem to be um in a uh i don't know you seem to be in a really good place about it if you will am i reading that right yeah i mean i've processed this a lot there there were mm -hmm. I, i've come through a really really dark place about it and i finally had this epiphany a couple months ago that i was like i'm not shackled to my job anymore and i hate to say that because i fought like hell to get that job in rpo and i it, it was hard i mean it's hard to get an orchestra job you guys know what it's like it's hard and you yeah. give up a lot and i waited till almost the end of my 30s to have a baby because of that job and and it feels really cruel that I was only full time for X number of years. I mean, not even ten years full time, but like, I I went through a lot. And then I the epiphany I had was like, I'm not shackled to this anymore. Of like these late nights, early mornings. I'm like, I can do whatever I want. Was the epiphany? And I was like, yeah. Oh my god, I can do yep. anything I want. And yeah, I have this limitation that's coming at me. But like, everybody's got a limitation. And it just was this huge, like, expansive thought that hit me. It was almost so expansive that I was like, holy cow, how do I limit that to what I actually want to do now? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, totally. I don't I mean, know, it, it opens I up through. <laughs> yeah, it, it opens up all kinds of great possibilities, in my opinion. Um, I mean, I know it's something you have to process, but I'm excited about what you can do with it and where you can go with it. So, uh, So I totally agree with you. And so one thing that you might consider is, there's a lot of people who are at the beginning of this journey and need to process it. It might be really good for you to have, um, to consider some kind of a, since you're a great teacher, some kind of a, a coaching practice where you help people in the beginning stages of this or middle or, you know, uh, where they're first processing that they're losing an ability. And, um, perhaps you have a method for like, uh, like one thing that you experienced in the starting line challenge is that I actually have a method. And mm -hmm. so there's a, there's a process that I took you through. And that's why at the end of seven days, you were like, holy cow, I see all these things I haven't seen before because there's actually a method behind it. And um, so you can, there, there's an opportunity to create a method that takes people through a process to process, if you will, through this thing that's happening to them. That is a very viable um, income source for you because many people, like, again, it's one of those things that you said earlier, um, this is not talked about. People keep it quiet, but, uh, and who, who can they talk to about it? Who understands this but someone who's been through it? That's you. Mm -hmm. So that's one option for you, I think, is to consider, um, and it would be like, you know, I know you do private teaching um, for base. Uh, this would be like private uh, teaching for, um, walking people through the, uh, the processing of this kind of, uh, an issue. So something that's a bit coaching and a bit therapeutic. Yeah. Is what that sounds coaching, like. A little therapeutic. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and, uh, there, there's multiple ways to do that, but I'm just, it's just an idea I want to throw out there if you haven't considered it, because there are plenty of people who, would much rather talk to and work with someone like you who has been through it and can um, speak to it, like a personal experience that you have with this. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to get that from a regular re regular coach. Like a regular coach is, I, I, I'm not, I, I mean, there's a certain level of processing I can help somebody do about this, but have I ever experienced it? No. Sure. No. I have no idea what it's like to lose your hearing. Sure. No idea. And, and I, like, I can't, and, and to actually have experienced that, I have no idea. So that's just one thought. And by the way, it's not something you have to do anything with. I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility because there is no question that um, it would be amazing for, um, for you to make yourself visible is one thing I'll tell you is I recommend, the first thing I, I want you to do of all things is I want you to make yourself visible. I want you to stand up and say, my name is Galen McCormick, and I am losing my flippin' hearing. That's mm -hmm. the first thing to do. Make yourself visible, because the one thing that nobody's doing is making themselves visible, and that's why this is an invisible problem. 
Yes. People would follow you just because you stood up and said, this is happening to me. Do you know, I've only spoken about it a little bit within um, the Ixom world because I was the Rochester Philharmonic rep for a few years here. And so even just within that tiny group, you know, which is the group of 50 orchestras um, in this country, just within that group, I'm the go-to girl for this particular disease I have. But it's always under this kind of shady cover, like I'm writing to you for someone else I can't name because they have this problem. And so I wind up going through an in-between. It's really interesting. So it's like I, I have talked about it a little bit, but I agree with you that um, I'll be happy to stand up and tell my story I want to throw one more thing into the pot for you, Eileen, to think about, and yeah. that is, and I think it works out great with what you just talked about. I would love to bring elements of mindfulness practice because it's something I've been working on for years now, um, and I'm using it in the auditions class that I'm teaching at Eastman right now. Um, mm -hmm. We're working on, you know, using regular audition taking books like Don Green's book. Um, you mm -hmm. know, where you're doing practical approach of actually taking auditions, but I added a third track of doing a regular mindfulness practice with them. And it's something I thought, boy, I, I do it in a kind of a sneaky way when I'm working with students who are little, we don't talk about mindfulness directly as I'm helping them, you know, learn how to perform, sure. but it's something I would love to bring into like coaching, for instance, uh, like you said, like people who are transitioning to deafness or who are just, you know, learning to deal with a disability that's come into their life. Right. Totally. I love that idea. And one of the things I recommend doing is, um, you know, like uh, if you decided, for example, to set up a really simple website and I don't want to get too far down the track, but I just want to throw some things at you about this. One thing is I understand what you just said to me about um, people are contacting you and saying, I'm contacting you. Uh, the person who I'm talking about, I'm contacting you for them because they don't want anyone to know la 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 that I'm, you know, going deaf, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One thing you can do is you can have some resources on a website that people can come and, and download quietly and privately um, mm -hmm. to begin to deal with this um, problem private. Because I think initially people want to be private about it because, I mean, they're pro some of them are probably like you. They have jobs, like important jobs. You know, you've been a player and a teacher, and now you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my studio. Uh, soon I'm not going to be able to perform anymore. Um, but, you know, you want to keep that on the DL as long as possible until you right. sort out what's going to happen with your life. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it's almost like they can start a quiet conversation with you about this. Um, like they can start it privately by downloading something and reading something. And that's why I say I want you to have some kind of a format, like some kind of a, a process to take people through, like an initial steps kind of thing. Because you're sort of taking, you know, you're... The, the great thing about being a public figure in this way is that you're like two or three steps ahead of them. You're 10, is, did I get that right? 10 months into this? You're 10 months yeah, in? Yeah. Is that right? That's about right. Yeah. Okay. And so you're 10 months into this. And so you're, t but you're 10 months ahead of somebody who, uh, and, and soon you're going to be a mo uh, 12 months ahead and soon 16 and soon 18 and then 24. And then like eventually you're, you're multiple steps ahead of people who are just starting on this journey and they have nowhere to start because there's nothing available for them to even, like, where do they go? They can't talk to anyone. Right. You know, and so that's yeah. one thing I recommend is allow people to begin their journey with you. Like, make it, make yourself visible and make it possible for them to begin their journey with you quietly because you're the mm -hmm. only option. Like, that you're That makes it. a lot of sense. Yeah. And and here's what I'm going to tell you. I told I told Tracy about this too, especially like regarding crushing classical. So, um, I want to I want to paint a little picture. Tracy, I'm going to tell her about Texas. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Okay. So, so here's the thing. Um, I want you to imagine that whenever you walk into a market, there is a. I want you to imagine that the marketplace is Texas, like the state of Texas. Okay. And the reason why I choose Texas is because it's very big. It's a very big state. There's a lot of land. But, you know, if you think about it, there's Houston down there at the bottom, and then there's Austin, and there's San Antonio, and then there's El Paso up in the left-hand corner, and there's Dallas, you know, uh, towards the west side, north. and like. But you notice there's a lot of unclaimed un, uh, land in Texas. You notice that? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of places that people aren't living yet. It's just land 
There's nobody there. And this is what the marketplace is. This is what the marketplace is. And so whenever you go on the market, one of the, the, one of the ideal positions you can take, if you can take it, so a, lot, a lot of times it's already settled and you can't take it, but um, there is no um, land in Texas claimed if you're a musician or a singer, whatever, like whatever you are, you're losing an ability. Let's say you are a musician and you're losing an ability like hearing, uh, a very important ability, like critical to being a musician. There is no land that we know of anyway that somebody put a flag down in Texas in some vacant land and said, I own this land. Nobody's done that yet. The opportunity you have is to claim the land nobody has claimed yet in Texas. <laughs> Do you understand the analogy? Yeah, I never thought about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Nobody has put their flag down. Nobody put it down yet and said, I own this land. I'm leading this conversation. I have this problem. I'm going to help you solve this problem. Okay. Yeah. Nobody's done that. And that's the opportunity that you have. And And what's so great about that, Galen, is... It means you can literally do almost anything and it will work <laughs> because nobody's <laughs> doing anything. Because <laughs> no one's doing anything. Do you get it? Yeah. Yeah. There's like, no, there's, you can do no wrong is what I'm trying to tell you. It's impossible because nobody's doing it right. Nobody's doing it at all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you got to get it. Like, that's a beautiful thing about um, establishing vacant land in Texas and putting your flag down and saying, okay. I know Houston exists, I know Austin exists, I know El Paso exists, I know Dallas is there, I know San Antonio is there, I know, uh, you know, there's all these places in Texas, but there's a lot of vacant land in Texas. Yeah. You know, there's just ranches nobody cares about. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just dying for you to bring your flag in and the cavalry and just smack it on down and go, this is mine. Boom. And the thing is, you can have it just because no one's there. And this is an example of, and you're going to laugh when I say this, because I used to think this is bullshit. When I watched the movie, uh, you know, the movie Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Remember that? Okay. So I used, to, I used to go, that is such bullshit, right? Because I've been in, I've been in, um, <laughs> I've been in business for 15 years and I've been telling people forever. Um, the, if you build it, it will, they will come is bullshit. Well, let me tell you the exception to that rule, which is what we're talking about right now, which is that no land has been settled and everybody has the problem and no one's talking about it. And so you can settle that land and everyone who wants to talk about it, who's been dying to talk about it is going to go, Oh my God, there's a new city. That's my city. That's what they're going to do. True enough. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. I'm going to tell And listen, we've experienced it with Crushing Classical. I want you to know. Yeah. I remember telling Tracy, like, we're settling land in Texas. And of course, you know, there are other, there are other people in our space. But we're doing something so unique in the space that people are like, you know, you either find us or you find one of our quote unquote competitors. We're not really competitors because we do something different. But if you find one of our competitors... And you, you look at either one of us, we're so different that either we are your people or they are your people. And there's nothing in between. Right. <laughs> you understand? Because we are such, like, you know, if you go to San Antonio, let's, let's just be clear, okay? I don't know if you've ever been to Texas, but if you, go to, if you go to Austin, you either love it or you hate it. If you go to San Antonio, you either love it or you hate it. If you go to Houston, you either love it or you hate it. Yeah, it's there's such different places in Texas, such different places. I mean, really, really, really. And I only I live there. I lived in Texas for almost five years and I've been to all those places. I've never been to El Paso, but I mean, I never wanted to go. Let me just be clear. Um, <laughs> you know, like I, I went to I went to Lubbock and I was like, yeah, no, this is not happening. You know, um, I went I lived in Austin, you know, but I'm, I'm just saying, but this is this is how it is in business. I'm just, this is not a, this is not a, you know, what do you love about Texas conversation? This is a, do you understand business com uh, t about Texas? Because Texas is a representation of what the marketplace is. 
I get it. <laughs> That's a great you analogy. It? Yes. Right? It's really what it is. Because if you go to, and, and if you've ever been or you haven't been, you should go to Texas just to see what I'm talking about because you will drive in, you'll go, oh, this is not it. And then you'll drive in, you go, oh, this is it. Ooh. Like really, it's, oh, no. it's that oh, way. No, no. It's very much that <laughs> way. And so. Yeah, we. <laughs> Have you been? Have you been to Texas? You know what I'm talking I, about? I have. I have family in um, in Dallas, but where my stepmother grew up is this tiny, tiny little cow town that is literally called Bovina for all the bovines oh. there. Oh. Okay, interesting. <laughs> oh, you smell it coming in. It's hilarious. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. It's and, not and my this people is, there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's what you, that's what you just, like, Texas is that way. It's either this is it for me or this is not it for me. It's It's very... It's such an interesting state because wherever you go, you're like, yeah, this is it or woohoo, this is not it. And that's how the marketplace <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. This is not. And so that's what I, I, I just want you to know. That's the real opportunity you have is um, establishing a platform, standing up with your flag and saying, I'm it for this. I'm it. And you can say that because literally no one else is there. And And the thing is, when, you know, 10 months ago or whenever this started for you, you probably wondered, I mean, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. You probably wondered, is there anyone talking about this? Is there anyone who can help me with this? Did you, did you have that in your mind at all when this came? I don't know that I wondered. I actually felt like I was just alone. I, I don't think I even could wonder. I just, I felt helpless for quite a while, actually. Okay. It was really and weird. I kind of just isolated myself before I even thought to reach out. And then I, I was lucky because of the deaf community here thinking to say to me, you should join this national group. But in terms of a musician who could help me, I still don't know one. Sure. That, sure. That, I get that. I think and... would be particularly helpful if I could talk oh, to a musician. Yeah, um, there is amazing. actually an amateur musician group that I belong to on Facebook. And I don't mean to belittle them at all. If they're listening to this, guys, you know, I love you. But what I'm looking for is particularly a professional musician who's gone through this transition because you know how special this is and how excruciating this might be. I think you guys could just imagine, you know? Yeah, totally. Totally. And I'm curious, um, uh, excuse my ignorance. So I might speak out of turn here. So I don't know. I hope I don't insult anybody. Does this also apply to somebody who um, acquires focal dystonia? I actually don't really understand what focal dystonia is, to be okay, honest. Okay, Tracy, do you know? Um, I know that it can affect um, your hands and it can affect your face, like your embouchure. So okay. um, it's really nerve and muscle related. Okay, so um, what's... But it's, okay, good. You know, it's related because you're losing an ability. That's what I, that's what I was going to say is, um, by the way... Galen, is you can serve that community as well. You could serve the focal dystonia community who, um, like, it is, quote, unquote, normal to, for focal dystonia. Like, losing your hearing is probably less common than focal dystonia is, is my guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's le because you don't hear about it. Like, you know, you hear about focal dystonia, but you don't really hear about hearing loss. That's not common. But one thing to understand is that losing an ability as a musician means you're going to have to create something completely new, completely different. And that's what I think your opportunity is, is to, um, for people to be able to process that loss and also um, begin to imagine, create something new. Um, I think there is, you know, so there, there's like two sides of it and it's up to you what you want to serve, but I just want you to understand it's, it's two sides. It's the, um, and, 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 I, and I don't want to use the word therapy, but I'll just use it for right now. It's the therapeutic side how do you heal your mind, body, and, you know, thinking about this? And then also, mm -hmm. how do you now move into um, what's next for you? Mm -hmm. How do you now explore what's next for you? And so I, I just see two sides to this. And, and it's anything, anything where a musician, I think, is, is certainly you can focus on the hearing community, or sorry, the deaf community, but you can also um, bring in just losing an ability as a, as a very capable and able musician suddenly losing a critical ability and can no longer perform or whatever the thing is that they used to be able to do at full capacity. Mm -hmm. Something to consider that it's, you know, you can, there's, there's other quote unquote, um, incapacitating events. Mm -hmm. 
And so you can you can welcome them all is what I'm saying if you want to. I'm just I'm I'm throwing it out there as an option. I think that's terrific. There is someone who just moved here um who who is hoping to open something sort of similar to that. Now that you say that, it just kind of jogged my memory that she actually has a double degree with psych because she had also gone through some kind of a similar kind of focal dystonia. I just didn't have to apply those words to it. Um, it'd be kind of interesting to pair up with her and just kind of talk shop about that and what she's hoping to do. Um, yeah. I think she was, you can... I know when I first met her last year and she moved here, she was hoping to talk about helping people transition out of performance and into other aspects of their career. And I remember as I sat down to meet her, we had a mutual friend in common. I just kind of stared in disbelief and I said, did our mutual friend tell you what's happening to me? And she's like, no. I said, oh, I feel like you were sent here to help me. <laughs> and we had a few conversations about this because she is a little bit interested in that, but I believe she has a kind of a different uh, slant on it, um, just coming from a psych perspective. Because I think it's people yeah. that are dealing with um, a sort of like an overactive performance anxiety that can't sure. be controlled. So anyway, yeah. um, but like, that's, that's amazing. Actually, everything you're saying, my whole insight is like, yeah, that sounds great. I would love to do something like that. I would love yeah. you know, just helping people get through that because everyone has an innate ability to do something else once you can process this major event that's happening. That's right. And, you know, and also I think what's important about this is, um, you know, one of the things we're trying to do at Crushing Classical, obviously, is we're trying to get you guys to talk to each other. Um, that's been a real challenge for us from the beginning, trying to get the classical community even to admit that they're having problems or that they want to improve or um, that the, you know, practicing, you know, a million hours a day isn't getting it done. Um, even even admitting to each other instead of peacocking to each other about, you know, how perfect <laughs> they are, you know, like. Uh, the whole peacock thing that classical musicians do, like we're trying to bust that up. We are actually actively working on busting up. Like we want you guys to be, um, we want you guys to fillet yourselves in front of people, in front of each other, instead mm -hmm. of pretending like everything is fine. And so that's, I think a big part of what you're, you can offer that would be helpful is community. Um, that's what you tapped into in the starting line challenge was that community. That's what was so well, you know, that was one aspect of the starting line challenge that worked so well. Oh, that was, was huge. That was, was huge, right? Yeah, yeah. it's amazing, right? You all of a sudden you were like, oh, they're my friends. You know, like it was <laughs> oh. exciting, you know? They're not just my friends. They're my people who want to like yeah. get shit done. And like right. the fact when you got to that last day and you started talking about closing loops and then for the next what? seven, eight, nine days, here we are every day going, look at what I did today. Look at how I'm making yep. progress. Here's all this right. is coming to life. I'm like, my people. <laughs> I know, right? It's amazing. It's really amazing. Yeah. And so, yeah, and th that's exactly right. And so, but that's, and I, I'm, I'm sharing that with you because you have exactly the same opportunity that we had here, which is to create, like we recognize right away that we, we were going to have to create, somehow bring you guys together, like somehow, we were going to have to get you guys to talk to each other and be honest with each other. And, um, you know, it just so happened that the challenge mechanism worked really, really well for that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and part of it is the way I facilitated it, but the other part of it is that you guys just decided to just up and be honest about it instead of, you know, and, and that was facilitated inside of a, cl a closed group, of course. Right. Right. Cause certainly you weren't going to do that on a page, like on a, you know, public page that was not going to happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, there were established rules around it, like, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas and things like that. So, yes. right. That, that was a big part of it. So it, certainly it was a creation of ours, but it's nothing you couldn't create in your own way, um, you know, creating your own groups. But and seriously, like, I'm not joking. I, I'm really not kidding. You don't need a resume, a doctorate or anything else to just plant your flag down in some vacant land in Texas. And there's plenty of it. And just go, this is, this is happening to me. And this is what I'm creating. And they will, people will come. This is the one exception to, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> because they're looking for a place to come. Nobody was looking for a baseball field in the middle of Iowa, but everybody is looking for this. Everybody wishes this existed. Everybody wishes that this because right now, the only thing they can do is what you did, which is sit 
in their living room um, by a warm fire going, what am I going to do? Right. And nobody actually wants to do that. Nobody actually, seriously, wants to solve their problems alone. Nobody actually wants that. Right. Yeah. Nobody does. Nobody wants that. It's so much easier to do it in conversation. It's so much easier to do it in community. And all you have to do is provide the structure for that, and they will come. And listen, we're living proof of that. Right here, Russian classical. We're living proof of that. I mean, it was hard work. But here we are, you know, a year and a half later, almost two years. We'll be, you know, two years next year, or beginning of next year. Um, two years later, and it's it's like a whole different ball game. What is a classical musician but a glutton for hard work? Come on. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And But, you know, it's funny. The classical music, you guys proved it in the last challenge. The classical music community actually does want to talk to each other. You guys yeah. actually yeah. do want to be friends. You guys actually do want to share. You guys actually do want to support each other. You guys actually do want to cheer for each other, which for the longest time you probably assume that nobody wants to cheer for my for my good the good things that happen. Like everybody just wants to make me, you know, judge me. Well, well, you found out that, that that's not actually true. Mm -hmm. That's not actually true. And everybody believed that for a really long time. And if there's one thing I really want to bust up, like this is a personal goal of mine, is I really want to bust that up. I really want to bust up that people, um, you know, that everybody's assuming that everybody's judging you. That's not true. Nobody actually really wants to judge you. That's just what they do when they don't know what, when they have no other option or, you know, there's no other context created for them. Because mm -hmm. it was really the context that, I created in that group that shifted the group that made the group what it was. Yeah, I agree. That's what it, that's what, that's what made the group what it was. And so, I mean, like there was a design behind the whole thing. There was a way I did it. And so you have that opportunity. You have that opportunity to lead a community of people. And that's, I mean, this is a platform. This could be a Ted talk. There's so many different things you could do with this, but Honey, somebody is, nobody's got their flag down and it's your choice if you want to put your flag down and own the space. Mm -hmm. You can have it. <laughs> Seriously. I remember telling this to Tracy a long time ago. Tracy, do you remember what I told you about crushing classical when you started it? When I, when you told me about the Texas thing? Yeah, I told you about the Texas thing, but I was like, you know, I mean, I, I remember saying to you. When are, you know, at what point are you going to decide that you own the space? Right. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you, yeah. have, if you have any memories of it or what you want to say about, if you have anything even to say about it, but I just remember saying that to you, like, when, when are you, like, you don't have to, it's a choice. You certainly don't have to, but when are you going to decide that you own the space? Yeah. And, um, when I finally did decide that, it was, it changed everything because it was, I was coming from a place of not really, not worrying about what other people were doing anymore. You know what I mean? Yep. Like mm. who else is in the space and, oh, she has a PhD and oh, this and oh, that and oh, this. Like, because initially Tracy was, you know, she would go find people online. She'd go, oh, Eileen. Yeah. But this guy... I don't know. You know what I mean? Like she would, yeah. she, she would find other people. I mean, I hope you don't mind if I like out you here, Tracy, but it was funny because <laughs> I thought, right. Like she would, she would go online and she would find other people who were doing things in the space and she'd go, uh, uh, oh, uh. I would go, uh, I don't uh oh, yep. uh oh, yep. because coming from a, from, coming from the classical music world where, you know, you show up and, and there's one opening. <laughs> And right. if someone else is qualified more than you on that day, then they get it instead of you. And then, then that's over. It's over. And so this is different because right. it's not just one thing. You know, it's, it's not just not, this one position. There's not just one opening. There's not there's just not one, just one just opening. There. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. It's it, like, it took me know, a while to bust that up for myself. And so that's totally. what I would do. I would go on. I would some something would pop up <laughs> in my feed or I would find something on a Google search. And then I go, oh, I'm not the only one who's doing this anymore. Eileen, yeah. yeah, I don't know if I can. Eileen, I can't do this. 
Eileen, I can't do this because this guy is here. Like that's what, seriously, like she yeah. was funny. Like for for several months. She and yeah, this. you got annoyed with me. You're like, <laughs> I was like, Tracy. I mean, you were just like, look, you don't you keep doing this and you don't have to do this. Yeah. You Not really the... don't have to because there's see, in orchestra land, there's only one spot. In business land, there's whatever the fuck you want available. <laughs> <laughs> okay well, you yeah. want like, the you land you put your flag down too. yeah that's what i'm saying like you, you want the land and you want to create a little town and it's a little creepy and you've got a haunted house and you've got a weird hotel with spirits in it and and somebody's going to want to come to that town <laughs> right right but it, but in orchestra right. land there's only one spot and it has to be a certain way and you have to play a certain way and uh -huh. you have to look a certain way right. and whether you're a girl or a boy la 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 that's orchestra land that is not the rest of the that's not any that's not any other market that's only in orchestras just so you know right well yeah, I, tracy right? i keep doing what you've been doing too which is like i keep looking at these other things because for a while i was sort of doing the I think the like the next most acceptable thing, because I know we talked about that in the starting line, like, well, if you can't do performance, you do education yep. or you do administration. And then I started looking at like, oh, I should do a degree. Oh, I should have a DMA, a la la la, and things like that too, <laughs> where I'm like, oh, I don't have these things. And like putting myself in this box, but it's like, you're right. Like you don't have to have a degree. You don't have to do those things. And mm -hmm. I think that's part of what starting line did for me too, is just that whole, like, you don't have to do anything in a particular order. That's right. <laughs> and that kind of goes back to the whole epiphany of like, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Oh, there goes the That's other right. Oh, well, that's all right. You said it was all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, like, you can do whatever you want and you can do it whenever you want to start it. And I, I finally feel well enough, both physically healthy enough and like finally over the hump of the morning of the change of my body now that I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And, and I don't need a degree. And I, I just need to embrace what it is the next direction is going to be. So I'm glad you said that, though, because we do, you're right, orchestra players get locked into, there's one job and I have to be the one to get it. And so you're, yeah. right. you're like, you know, and you then don't you're, need to feel like that. <laughs> exactly. And the, that locked into, am I qualified to do yeah, this yeah, thing? That. And you're making it up. You're qualified. You're the most qualified person that there is because you made it up. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know? you know, Tracy, Tracy has a failed top five uh, pursuit and she's, you know, the head of crushing classical. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> right. She has a, she has a successful freelancing career, a successful, um, uh, I'm going to call it a playing career, just not as a, um, you know, named position. Cause she was what, 10 years in North Carolina symphony. Yeah. But... I called my, they, they wouldn't put my name in the program. So it would always say to be filled, even though that position wasn't even a position, but they put it there to make themselves look good. Like, Oh, this is a position. It's going to be filled soon, which was a lie. Cause they're, <laughs> it's not a position. So I call, right. I said that my, that my name was Toby Filed. <laughs> <laughs> And she started calling herself that. And and yeah. seriously, like, but, but I mean, really that's, you know, it, it, you know, Tracy by, by, by musician standards, she would need to go get another degree and she would need to get, win an orchestra job and she would need to this or that or this or that in order to do yeah. Russian classical bullshit. Bullshit. Yeah. Not right. true. That's bullshit. I have to say Th that, that I switched that. careers and I went and got a different degree outside of the degree that the two degrees I already have so that I can say that I'm no. I invented it. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. She went, she went out and got a degree in life. And now that's the degree that's carrying her to the future, you know, to what's next for her. Um, yeah. And, and somehow, and, and in some ways the degree in life was even more, um, you know, more of an education than the two degrees she already, that she got. Yeah. You know, the actual yeah. degrees. And so yeah. that's what I'm saying here is like, you know, I, I really don't, it's funny because um, you mentioned that woman who's got a PhD um, don't let her deter you from uh, going and buying the prettiest, brightest, biggest, fattest, and most amazing flag at the <laughs> store and, you know, riding out into the middle of Texas in your Hummer and getting out, <laughs> right, and smacking that thing down. Um, you know, it's going to be dusty out there. Wear your cowboy boots. But for real, like, it can be yours. Because nobody else is going to settle it. And I'm not kidding you. Again, the only exception, you'll probably never hear me say this again in my entire life. Can't believe I'm saying it now. If you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. 
and you know the you know the field of and you know that was like the thing about field field of dreams when I finally got into uh, business. I was like, that is such bullshit. This is the exception. <laughs> really, this is the exception. In any other market, I would tell you no, but in this market, it is available to you. And and so, um, it really is whatever you can imagine that you want to create for people. But just remember that there is a. Um, because there is a, you know, this is what we had to deal with in Crushing Classical. People were still peacocking and pretending and not wanting to, you know, high five each other, you know, not supporting each other. Um, just this sort of negative, there's just sort of this negative thing in classical music, how people, uh, treat each other, you know, like yeah. it's a rivalry. It's a rivalry. Yeah, total and rivalry. Oh, my God. It's a rivalry. That's what it is. And and it's in between, you know, it's it's not even teams. It's people. It's just like individual people. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we, we have been over time breaking up that rivalry. And what you're going to have to break up is, as you know, the silence, mm -hmm. the silent epidemic. Yeah. That this that exists here. The mm. the thing nobody wants to talk about. And. You know, you can even give it really fancy, like you can even call it the silent epidemic. Like we could, you know, there's another, other names that we could come up with for that. You know, there's, you can create a whole set of unique vocabulary. You know, you actually got exposed to some of my vocabulary in the starting line challenge, actually. Um, that's, and, and you guys sort of hooked onto it during the challenge. Um, that's very similar to what I would tell you to do. Um, and since you've been through the challenge, you probably have a sense of that. Um, so, just, you know, that, that's, the, it's such a huge opportunity you have. I mean, it's, it's even more amazing than probably you're thinking about it, but really the, the, the first step is just to be willing to be, become visible. Mm -hmm. That's the first step to be, be willing. And by the way, do people know like at Eastman and um, Nazareth uh, College and all these places, do they know about what's happening? Uh, fifty fifty. Nazareth knows. Community school knows. <laughs> I don't think almost anyone at my orchestra knows yet because I have been super weird about who I would tell. So my bass section knows to a small extent, and I don't think the rest of the orchestra knows. And here's the real kicker of how isolated and ivory towered, or whatever you want to call it, siloed is. I don't know who's even noticed beyond the bass section that I haven't played there since last Christmas. <laughs> oh, isn't it amazing how you can, you know, if you don't walk through, the, you know, the two stage doors to come on stage, like if you don't through walk through that stage door that I'd be warming up at, I don't think they've even noticed. <laughs> Interesting. Even though I have purple hair. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I did come back. I had one really brief bout for like two weeks where my hearing came fully back in March. And so I thought I was having a really, I didn't know then that it was going to go on this long. So I actually came back to work for about a week before my hearing went away again. So I came back and at that point, like only a few viola players and cellists were like, oh, you're back. You know, were you sick? Did you have the flu? And then I was gone. And so I haven't really had a chance to tell many people. So I don't really know. Um, yeah, I don't really know what the orchestra knows. <laughs> okay, well, it's what? Kind of weird. Okay, so one thing, one thing I would do is, you know, so does management know? I, I, the personnel manager knows, and I've been really weird with him too about how much I'm willing to let him tell the conductor and and the whole management staff because we have a ton of turnover with um, the CEO and things like that. And I was just real concerned about what would happen if my situation changed. I, I just didn't know. I, I felt like it was better to protect myself going down the road in case my hearing did come back. I didn't want to get into some weird thing down the road. But what would you okay. suggest? Well, one thing I would do is um, I, I really um, one thing I don't want you to feel like you have. This is the first this is the first step for me is I don't want you to feel like you need to hide it at all. Um, uh, because you you cannot if if your intention is to help the um, hard of hearing community, the deaf community, hearing impaired community, um, in any way, and especially people who are going through this, you actually have to be open about it. And so yeah. I think one of the first things I recommend doing is having a conversation with, you know, whoever, somebody you feel safe with at the orchestra, um, you know, like somebody in the management and just say, Hey, listen, I just want you to know this is happening and I don't know what the results are going to be, but I just want you to know, and I mean, be, be really casual about it. I want you to know that this is happening. 
Um, and I don't know, like I, re it, it returned in March, but then it went away again. And, you know, like, so I'm sort of in varying degrees of hearing right now. And I just want you to be aware that, um, um, I don't know what's going to happen with it. And I promise to, at the very least, I promise to report to you if I feel like at any point I cannot serve my position. Like if I'm not going to be, if I'm not going to serve this position well, I'm going to come and tell you. Like right. at any point, like that's, that's the one thing. And I would do that with Eastman. Uh, if you're teaching, you know, still teaching there, I would do oh, that. Yeah, no, they Nazareth. know, they, they know the complete deal with that. Right. And of course all the students right. know. So the community school does and Nazareth, like all the teaching positions do. It was only with the orchestra that I was being a little bit cagier and the personnel manager knows and the base section knows, you know, because they've had to live with me going through the hearing changing. Um, and we've, we've sort of come up with like how to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. I guess, no, I understand where you're coming from. I think my only concern was up until very, very recently, my concern was like what would happen down the road. But I'm realizing now I'm I'm squarely into an ADA situation where like I can't really get fired now for having a disability. So no way. I think I'm safe in this, in the sense of like, of course I would not. This is why I've pulled back into um, asking to be on disability is because I feel so strongly that I shouldn't be on stage. You know, that like I'm just, I'm too far out of my league now with my hearing being so down. So yeah. I feel like I'm doing right by my colleagues at this point. Yeah, you're but doing the responsible just... thing. It's very responsible exactly. what you're exactly. doing. Yeah, I mean, if you were if you weren't handling it responsibly, I'd, you know, I would I would say, hey, what's going on with you? Like, sure. you know, let's exactly. Go. But you're exactly. you're not having that issue. So I I would just be open about it, just so you can just so you can actually become visible because this is a really interesting time where, like you said. Um, you're still covered income wise. This is the time to stand up and get visible like now before you need, you know what I'm saying? Well, one of the things yeah. we, we did, we did a fireside not very long ago. And I, I think I said something like the time to look for another gig is a time when you don't need another gig. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the time. Uh, don't wait until you need one. Let me just, let me tell you, I've lived it. I freaking lived it. Mm -hmm. um don't wait until you need something else to start something else it's you start it before you need it because you've no like what you can build in that time is amazing yep <clears throat> mm -hmm. it's amazing um and and that's the opportunity you have right now which is why i'm like i hope she goes out and creates a page today or whatever right that's what i'm <laughs> i'm like secretly hoping that you're going to announce it in the you know in the challenge group that you know you've started something because that's the key is standing up and saying, this is happening to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. happening. And, um, and I'm not going to be quiet about it anymore. I'm not going to hide it. I'm going to tell everybody about it. And let me tell you, people will follow you in droves because either someone, this is happening to somebody or they know someone this is happening to. Mm -hmm. And people are going to go, you need to go follow this chick with the cool name. You need to go follow this chick. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be honest. Everybody wants to have a name, a sexy name like Galen McCormick. I mean, right? you know, I don't have that. Like, I, I'm, I'm Eileen Gordon. Yawn. Who wants that name? You have a cool name. <laughs> let's be clear. And then with the purple hair, who's not going to want to follow you? Like, who's not going to want that? You know? You know? Some Easy people... to spot at the grocery store. It's true. Exactly. Some people, some people just have it, and the rest of us just have yawn. We have to have we have to have other talents because we were not born with the name Galen McCormick. You could be a lounge singer with that name. Oh my! Okay, no one has ever said that to me before. Seriously, it's like no, but seriously, let me do it. It's it's like this. Introducing Galen McCormick. Can you hear it? Yeah, okay. I hear it. I totally yeah. hear it. Introducing, oh. and now we'd like to introduce you to Galen McCormick right wait 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 you have to cheese it up with like the vocal stylings of yeah exactly exactly see and, and i mean this is a good example of why i was never invited to speak on radio this is why okay but like you have a cool name so you i mean yeah there, you have so much going for you so much going for you and the only thing it takes is for you to, to go but go get that big flag well it's, smack it on it's, down it's, I know it's the next thing to do because it's the thing I least want to do. You know what I mean? I have told oh, yeah. so many times I have been so ready to put up on Facebook, which I realize is not that big an investment. But so many times I've been willing to, like, I'm so close to going, hi, everybody. Just so you know, the thing I have not been telling you for the last year is I'm deaf and struggling with what it means to be deaf and a musician. And then I'm like, erase, 
erase, you know, like keep that, keep that image up. Keep, just keep talking about the books, keep talking about the studio, or just keep talking about your cat and your family. And it's so funny that I always pull back at the last second, like image, image, image. It's and you really totally funny. nailed me on that during the starting line challenge for something else. And I'm like, oh, I got to think about this. I gotta oh, think yeah, about yeah, this. that's right. I remember mm -hmm. what I nailed you on, too. Yeah. I remember what mm -hmm. I nailed you on. Yeah. And and yeah. it's really funny. By the way, um, uh, Tracy, like I, I have to say this about Tracy. I'm, I'm totally assuming something here, but she's probably going to agree. Um, I don't <laughs> think Tracy ever could have imagined that telling her what she felt was a failure story would turn into uh, Crushing Classical. That, that she gets to every day tell a story that forever she probably deemed the ultimate failure mm -hmm. in her life became what it is today and what it's going to become in the future. Do you understand? Yeah. I mean, yeah, because yeah. this is something that uh, I was always trying to cover up by by eventually getting the job. Like, I don't this doesn't this isn't my story, because when I get that job, then that'll be my that's story. Right. And that's always mm -hmm. not the thing that's really in your life at the moment. And and that what that, you know, essentially telling my story and starting this has brought me to the present moment, actually. Mm hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and and she and she could never have figured that by not by you know doing that thing that you're talking about where you go, oh, I need to keep up appearances. I need to you used a better word for it, but you know I need to um, keep yeah, up the keep up my image, basically. The image, kind keep of, up the um, image. Yeah, it's curating. That's always what I feel like Facebook is. I'm curating a very specific image on Facebook. Exactly. You know, I'm like. I've been hiding my illness. In fact, I put up about my thyroid surgery the other day because I feel amazing, actually, after my thyroid surgery. And a bunch of friends immediately contacted me and said, like, holy shit, I had no idea you'd gone deaf or had this surgery. I'm like, oh, sorry about that. I, You're like, yeah, oh, yeah. I did a really good job curating my image, don't I? Right. <laughs> I conveniently forgot to tell you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, but, but I mean, like, you know, I, I'm just using Tracy as an example because if you would have talked to her, say, two years ago, uh, no way in hell she would have thought that by letting the image crumble down that anything could have been built from that. Right. There's no way. I got to tell just... you, that is actually really inspiring and heartening to that you would say that and admit that. I really appreciate that. Yep. Yeah. Because I, I mean, Tracy, I think of you as like so successful and so inspiring. And anytime you show any of the like, this went wrong, that went wrong. To me, it doesn't seem like a failure. It's just like, oh, it's your journey. I get it. You know, like it never strikes me as a failure. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, yeah, like, but you know, I mean, you admitted it earlier when you said you waited until your late thirties to have a baby. That's what I did because I was always like, uh, my real life can't start until I manage to get someone else to tell me that I'm a real musician by giving me a title. You know, yep. and then That's I'll show exactly what I was doing, you know, and then I'll show them because I did it. I did what I know I can, you know, I'll show them that I can do what I said I wanted to do, you know, mm -hmm. it's so weird. Yep. Yeah. I'll show them. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody, and so people are waiting to start their lives and waiting for this and waiting for that and waiting for this. And it's all image. Like you said, it's all curating your image and you know what they don't realize. Um, so many of them is like, there's so much vacant land in Texas. It's insane. And there, there is not just one spot. There is not just one opportunity. There's not the beautiful thing about getting out of orchestra land is how much opportunity there is. And that's why I use the Texas analogy so much because I want you to begin to see that that's what the marketplace is. And there is plenty of room for you. And in fact, you're in the most uh, ideal position because there is literally nobody who is putting their flag down and saying, I own the space. And that is your opportunity. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear you and I can, I, I'm passionate anyway in that, that intersection right there about helping people. And in particular, if I can broaden that out, not just to helping people, but helping musicians in particular. And then if I can, I think if I could broaden that or have a secondary thing in terms of bringing part of hearing community or deaf community yeah. in connection with the cultural community here in a way that's more meaningful than it is right now, because they're right now, they're not really in that much connection i think that would be awesome i think so too and i think um it would be great if people started talking about you know 
if music is important to the deaf community or the hard of hearing community, why? Um, and how does that work? And what does that look like? And what is being created for, why is that important? Um, you know, what, what is possible for them? You know, that's a, a definitely a possibility. Why, why I'm not going there first, even though you did mention it on this call, why I'm not going there first is because I'm looking for where the most likely income source is for you because you said that you want to create income out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going towards that first because uh -huh. if you solve the income problem, you can go after the under, you can do whatever you want. Right. You know? Right. No, I mean, the other one, the music and deaf of hard of hearing intersection thing, that could easily just be a side, almost hobby thing for me. It could be. And it would be a very nice, uh, you know, it'd be a nice little dovetail off of uh, the work you're doing with musicians who are, um, and again, it can be a coaching thing. It can be, um, you know, you can do workshops, seminars. There's all kinds of things that you can do yeah. um, with people who are dealing with this and open a conversation for it. And, you know, it's almost like, because again, part, there's two sides to it. There's a side of healing and then there's the side of, okay, what's next for me? Mm -hmm. You know, it's really cool because you've moved through this pretty quickly where you're like, yeah, this is happening to me. Okay, what's next for me? Like you got what you got to what's next for me very quickly. It's really interesting how you did that. And I would love to know how the hell you did that because, and yeah. believe me, a lot of people would like, how did you get from, um, you know, you would be a really interesting interview actually. How did, how the hell did you get from, um, you know, I'm losing my hearing and holy crap to only 10 months later, you're like, so what can I do now? This is so great. Well, what are the opportunities? That, that, that. Like, okay, okay. How the hell do you do that? This way, two years before that big episode, I knew I was symptomatic, and I started working on it then with, like, I started thinking then about grad school, or I took a job with Eastman doing a, running a summer camp to get some admin chops and to get myself into the pipeline of Eastman so that maybe I could move into administration. And I, I started positioning myself because, like you said, you know, the time to start looking for another job is before you need it. And I started talking to um, career counselors back then. Nobody wanted to touch me because they're like, you have, you work four jobs now. Like I couldn't even find time to schedule with a career counselor because I was so sure. working so much. Sure. But I said, but I'm going to go deaf someday and I want to position myself now to not be working in such a hearing field. And nobody wanted to touch me. It was weird. Sure. So I just started doing it myself. I'm like trying to make connections, you know, trying to do different things. Um, and so I just really wasn't getting anywhere, but at least I tried and I started putting myself out there. So, but I was, I think I was subliminal processing it for a couple of years. Um, but then, you know, when the shit hits the fan, it's like work on it now. Well, <laughs> really, That's right. And, 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 you know, that's interesting what you brought up. Um, you know, that whole thing about nobody wanted to touch me. Um, there is a, um, how do I say this? There is a, you know, when, what's interesting about that, Galen, is that when somebody reaches out for help, there's almost a, uh, like almost a, wait a second, you're damaged goods point of view. Like, it's not, because listen, it's one thing to talk, I find it interesting that somebody, I understand you were busy, like I understand you had um, you know, other things going on and you were super busy and probably couldn't fit it in. But there's another part of it where when you tell somebody that the reason you're changing careers is because you have an impairment, the first thing they do is think you're broken and they're like, oh, I don't want to deal with this one. I don't know. Like, it's okay if you lose a job and you want another career, but it's not okay if you have an impairment and you want to get another career. It's interesting. I know, but here's the kicker is this woman's job is to help people. Her specialty is people who are, well, no, her specialty is to help people who lost their job because of hearing loss. And so now I got reassigned to this same career counselor who is now in the process of not returning my calls and emails again. I'm like, I'm going to ditch this lady and probably find another career counselor. But at first I think I'm going to work through the ideas because you and I have just come up with some really interesting ideas that are probably far more creative than whatever she's going to talk about. Oh yeah. I mean, I, um, yeah. we could, I mean, we could, we could create this shit all day long. I'm just being honest. Like this is just the beginning <laughs> of what we could do. Like all, like I, I could get on like six hours of calls with you about what we could create. We could have it done by the end of the day. I'm just saying, but, 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 the, <laughs> but the thing is like, but it just kills me though. I think it's really interesting. I think that's probably a phase everyone's going to go through where their first reach out for help is going to be, Oh, I don't know if we can help this one. This one's broken because that's how people look at people who've got an impairment. Like all mm -hmm. of us, you're in a yeah. wheelchair. 
Oh, you're broken. Oh, you, you know, you're losing your hearing. Oh, you're broken. Oh, you're half blind. Oh, you're broken. Like wall, people are like, those people can work at Walmart. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. Walmart will, Walmart will take you, but nobody else will take you. Like there's just this sort of this, uh, you know, if you're a broken human being, you're a problem. There's a, there's right. just like a certain, and look, I, I don't have any, um, at least not yet, uh, any physical impairments that I've actually experienced this, but my mom was in a wheelchair. My mom actually had to have her legs removed because she, um, she got a, what do you call it? Not diabetes, but she had, um, she was a smoker for like, I don't know, 50 years. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the capillaries like died in her legs. And so basically, you know, she got like gout and they had to cut off her legs. Right. Okay. I know that's a little gross, but I'm just saying this is what happened. So, um, so anyway, but, but all of a sudden life shifted for her because she was in a wheelchair. It changed everything. Mm -hmm. It changed everything for her. And it was a real problem. And so I bring that up because I got to see what it was like to have a impairment through her eyes. Wow. And through my stepdad's eyes. For real. Um, it's not yeah. something I experienced myself, but it's something I, I watched her go through, if that makes sense. I watched her be limited by, I mean, gosh, just to get to a doctor's appointment was, you know, near impossible. You know, it, yeah. it was really something. And, and the way people treated her when she went certain places and the, how people talk to her and like all of a sudden, like, you know, real people who thought it one who knew her one time having legs, like then all of a sudden she didn't have legs and it changed everything. It changed how they communicated with her, how they, I mean, every, it, it just changed everything. And she hated it. She absolutely hated it. All of a sudden yeah. she felt like half a human because half of her was gone. Mm. Yeah. You know, and I bring that up because that's what happens when, I mean, I assume based on her experience, that's what happens when this happens to somebody, when you lose your hearing or some, some, you know, you lose a leg, you lose a limb, you lose a whatever that you become, um, the way people treat you is different. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that was instantly frustrating. And that's, that's part of why I wanted to bring mindfulness practice into whatever I do with this, I actually pitched to be a speaker at this conference I went to, the late deafened adults, because that wound up becoming a huge tool for me. The biggest difference is that um, until I learned to be visible, Eileen, until I learned to walk into any kind of retail situation and immediately say, I'm deaf, I need to see you looking at me, because I'm not really truly deaf yet. But if people uh, turn their back to me to like get something off a shelf and they talk, I don't hear them. I can't, I really need to see them speaking. So sure. if I didn't say that at first, because I was being vain, and they turned back around and I'd say, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't hear very well. Can you say that again? I get this really weird look because I don't speak like I'm deaf, you know, and I get this thing. Yeah, and you, what you I notice is more often than not, yeah. you know, they get frustrated. They don't want to deal with me. They treat me like I'm stupid. And it would happen really fast. It would happen over and over again. And I get really frustrated and I'd have to deal with that. And so, you know, I learned to be very visible, like you said, right off the bat, just like put it out there. I'm deaf. I need this. And then it went much better, but also just that I had to deal with frustration and realize it's not my problem that they're treating me this way. Actually, no. it's their problem, That's but it's right. hard it is to deal problem. with that day in day again. That's right. It is their problem. And, you know, I think my mom over time figured that out as well. Like she figured out that she needed to be a demand for what she needed, um, you know, for all the times that, you know, people sort of, you know, she just, you just get marginalized. Yeah. Is what happens. It's, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's just its own version of being marginalized is what it is. And so I just, you know, there's so much, oh my God, there's so much you can do with this. I hope you see that. I hope you see there's so much you can do with this. And I do. Um, I yeah, do. I just, I just, I'm waiting for you to, you know, settle in Texas so we can get a, you know, a hotel room and hang out there. I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> Tequila you know? shots for everybody. Tequila shots for everybody. <laughs> party in, party in, uh, party in Galen City. Galen City. Yeah. I like that name. That's good. Party in Galen City. So, so there you go. I hope this was helpful for you, really. Um, I, I actually love the opportunity that's in front of you. And it's really great to, um, to get, especially after we just did the challenge and I got to see everything that you wrote in the group. And it's just really great to actually connect with you and yeah. know who I'm talking, you know, actually hear your voice and, you know, know who I was, um, you know, interacting with in the group. Totally.
Well, I am honored, honestly, to get to come on your program. And I really appreciate the support and the, the help I just got today. This is really exciting to me. And I am looking forward to getting started with all of these ideas. Thank you both. You're awesome. Welcome. You're welcome. Great. This was a great one. I'm excited for this to come out. Thank you so much, Galen, for being on the hot seat today. And thanks, Eileen. This is awesome. So thank you. Awesome. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. 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 Oh, awesome. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you for listening today. Hey, listen, I have a huge favor to ask you, and it will only take a few seconds. If you like this show, one way that you can let us know is by writing a review on iTunes and subscribing to the podcast. Writing a review will help other people to find the podcast and help us immensely. It will only take a few minutes. Just head over to iTunes and search for Crushing Classical. There, you can write a review and click subscribe. Thanks again.